Last Sunday, it was no one in the movie business as Oscar Sunday. It was the day that the winners of the 84th Academy Awards were announced. And so throughout the rest of this last week, we have been bombarded with news about the winners and the losers and the actors and the announcers and hosts and what they wore and their journey up the red carpet. For example, we heard about Sasha Vera Cohen, who was criticized for the style of humor that he used on the red carpet. And it, the humor missed its mark completely and was just seen as utter rudeness. And Jennifer Lopez spent the rest of this week denying that she had any wardrobe malfunction. And Angel, Angela Jolie's right leg, she went whoosh, and stuck it out. That, that right, when she posed for photos, she was trying to utilize the slit to make a le leggy impression. It did not impress, and it was then uh, cut and paste onto the Statue of Liberty and Darth Vader and even Hillary Clinton. Lists of worst dressed actors on the red carpet distracted from the industry's main goal of recognizing true excellence in film. Does anybody even remember which film won? The artist. The artist. The artist. The artist. Hopefully the actors and actresses do not draw their identity and their self-evaluation from that red carpet coverage. Hopefully their ten dollars to $25,000 gowns and glittery, glittery jewels and the snippets of conversation that they stay on the red carpet does not set a realistic standard for the rest of us. But then maybe it does. Because those red carpet dresses Model um, miniatures of them, copies of them are all ready for sale. And just stop and think about the millions of dollars that we spend on cosmetic surgery and anti-aging creams and designer clothes and shoes. All of this chasing <coughs> society's ideal of what beauty is. Ideals that may be formed by the red carpet. Self-esteem is a psychological term used to describe a person's overall evaluation of themselves, of their own self-worth. It involves your ego, and it involves beliefs like, I am competent, or I am lacking. <coughs> it involves emotions like triumph and despair, pride and shame. If you overestimate your abilities, then you become too much, and your behavior might become like Charlie Sheen's. If you underestimate your abilities, then you don't think enough of yourself, and you might find an end like Marilyn Monroe, or Michael Jackson, or Whitney Houston. Not enough. You wouldn't think, if you're thinking that you're not enough, then it's not worth getting out of bed in the morning, and you could become trapped in the paralysis of perfectionism, and chronic indecision and neurotic guilt. Fortunately, we have Jesus as a model of healthy self-esteem and ego control. Jesus' red carpet parade ended at the cross. The cross was used by Romans to destroy the identity of anyone who was crucified. They were trying to wipe them right out of history, to make them a nobody. The crucifixions were held just outside of town so that everybody passing could clearly get that message that this is what happened when you opposed Rome. The body hanging on the cross was stripped of its personhood, and in that sign was meant to strip the population of their hope and crush any momentum towards change and kill any hint of rebellion or even of reformation and leave the whole of the surrounding community feeling naked and vulnerable and willing to conform to the Roman standards. Jesus knew this and yet he got on that donkey 
and paraded into Jerusalem anyhow. Every year during Passover, the Roman army would march into Jerusalem with full pomp and circumstances. Soldiers would brandish their weapons, and Pilate would ride high on a horse. And the, all the troops that followed would, would carry the banners of their victories. And this parade was meant to remind the people to behave, to warn travelers and worshipers in the area coming to Jerusalem for Passover that Rome ruled and that their religion was barely tolerated and that any uprising would be put down. But even though Pilate marched his oppression parade in the front gate, Jesus led his little parade of protest in the back gate. He was not persuaded by all that red carpet crowd that his self-worth needed to be raised based on their hosannas, but he was also not dissuaded from his ultimate destination of the cross and the humiliation that it would bring. He knew who he was <coughs> and he knew what his purpose was and he marched right into Jerusalem to hand himself over to that per process for our sake. He gave up his life so that we might belong fully and completely to the life-giving kingdom of God. This is the model that Jesus has set for us so that we can follow God's will without being pushed and pulled by our self-esteem or ego. Do you think that the crowds along the road from Bethany, Bethany to Jerusalem fully understood this model of self sacrifice as they threw their cloaks to the ground and yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna. Scholars teach that that word Hosanna is a contraction between two Hebrew words. Yasha meaning to save or to deliver and Na meaning to beseech or to pray. So really the crowds are shouting, we beseech you to deliver us or save us we pray. As they watched Jesus, who was rumored to be the Messiah, come to Jerusalem for Passover, they cut branches and threw them on the ground, and they cheered Hosanna. They cheered his challenge of the status quo, and they begged to be saved for the, from the Romans. I don't think they had any inkling of his true purpose of reconciliation. They wanted immediate relief. Did you ever... Feel compelled to yell, yell, save us, save me, Jesus, as we prepare for this holy week? A pastor once asked a seventh grade class this question. Since salvation implies that you are being saved from something, what do you think Jesus was saving us from? Now the first answer that came back was hell. But he probed a little deeper. He suggested that the crowds lining the, the parade to Jerusalem were not asking to be saved from hell. They wanted to be saved from the Romans. So he reframed his question and he asked that seventh grade class again, if God was on the ball, what would God save you from? And this time he got back different answers. Death, said the first young lady. My math test, claimed the second child. Pressure answered a third. My parents' expectations, said another. And then a shy child, speaking very quietly, confessed, fear. I want God to save me from my fear. I suggest that God can also save us from ourselves. I think God can save us from our own egos. Barry Brownstein, the author of Inner Work of Leadership, teaches that the ego strives to protect our identity and maintain our self-esteem. It holds us apart from the world. It defines us by our differences. Ego is focused on attaining external goals, thinking that they will bring fulfillment. 
An unrestrained ego leads to fear and arrogance and judgment and anxiety and guilt and conflict <coughs> and doubt and depression and fear. Ego has a tiny, warm view of the world. Our true self counterbalances ego by connection to God. Our true self wants the wholeness and sense of completion connect, uh, that we get in being connected to God's pervasive underlining force that brings harmony and peace and joy and freedom and fulfillment and love. This wholeness gives us an expansive bird's eye view of life and values our connection to God. This week I said to a fellow clergyman, I said, I still struggle with my own self-esteem. And he said, it's normal. You know, 28% of women struggle with their self-esteem. And so every Sunday, you know, I really work hard on, this, on the sermon, and I've done a lot of research, but I wonder sometimes, what's, you know, what's my role in this? Are these words going to be enough to change people's hearts? But you know what? It's not up to me alone. Of course not. That's why I pray every time I begin to preach, because it's the Holy Spirit working through me. I don't have to have a strong ego. I don't have to feel less. It's the Holy Spirit working through me to bring the message that changes people's hearts and the way we work in the world. We have a choice to be full of ego or to empty ourselves and make room for God. Full of ego, we ruminate and we judge and, and we panic. Full of God, we're more aware of life's dynamic forces and dynamic web of interconnections to all other people and all other things in the universe. <coughs> Shay Claiborne, who is the keynote speaker at the Leadership Days on the 17th of March that several of us are going to, he asked in a recent article, what is the difference between a stick in the mud and a wooden flute? It's the difference between a stick in the mud and a wooden flute. The stick in the mud is full of itself, and the wooden flute has um, emptied itself so it can make music. We too need to empty ourselves so that the spirit can blow through us and we can make divine music. All the major religions in the world have an element of self-denial at their core. Jews have Yom Kippur, Muslims have Ramadan, and Christians have Lent. In a world filled with the clutter of material goods, and the noise of other people's opinions, and the hustle towards red carpet living, Lent is a good excuse to step back and reconsider how we think and live. It's an opportunity to give up something that's sucking the life out of us, or to take up something like devotions and prayer practices or holy silence so that we can be filled with God and with life and with love again. Jesus did not draw on the adoration of the red carpet crowds to fuel his journey to Jerusalem. Rather, he trusted God completely as he traveled to the cross. Judged by the standards of his days, he appeared to be a victim and a failure when he didn't meet the crowd's expectations. But by measured by the standards of unconditional love, he surpassed all expectations. Unconditional love is that love shown by parents and lovers and patriots and committed people of every kind who disregard the messages of ego for the actions of love. Consider the example, the other example that's been in the news at the later half of the week. Strangers gathering, running into towns that maybe they had never been in before to help us alleviate the suffering 
of all that disaster caused by the, in the Midwest by the tornadoes. They're not caught up in their own safety. They're not caught up in their own comfort. They're not thinking that they are above sweating it out for other people. They're coming to help. That is God at work. The love that prompts us to give of ourselves is but a portion of the abundant love of God. Jesus' example of selfless love and his unexpected resurrection changed the symbol of the cross from one of oppression into a symbol of liberation, of hope, and of love. And we who have decided to follow Jesus hold that cross of hope before us, trusting that we are saved, even from ourselves, and trusting that our identity as a beloved child of God is good enough. And we, too, are willing to move boldly forward to serve the world. Amen. Amen.